Hi, my name's Will Crombie from The Organic Compound. I'm a farmer and filmmaker that's dedicated to empowering leaders for a regenerative future. And speaking of leaders, we've got Mark Shepard and Johan Rinkins here today for another episode of Regeneration Conversations. So let's jump right into it because they are about to drop some ecological knowledge on you. Check it out. So regenerative is what we were all talking about these days. Bringing regenerative leaders together. And this story about regenerative and regeneration. This is a discussion we need to have and information we need to get out to other farmers. Hey there, my name's Mark Shepard. Uh, I suppose I could call myself a farmer. I've grown uh, certified organic produce for 25 years. I'm a member of the Organic Valley um, Produce Pool. Uh, I also grow and breed chestnuts and hazelnuts and uh, pine nuts, a whole bunch of other things as well. I uh, run a tree and shrub nursery named Forest Agriculture Enterprises and uh, have a consulting business where we do consulting design and installation of edible woody cropping systems and we help farmers to transition from annual plants like corn and beans and wheat to perennial crops. Nice. My name is Johan Rinkins. I'm with Fields Without Fences from Frenchtown, New Jersey. Uh, we are a perennial polyculture farm focused on small fruits and berries, culinary and medicinal herbs. I've been uh, working with Mark for the last two years or so through restoration agriculture development as well. We also do our localized and regionalized permaculture, ecological design, install consulting thing as well. It's been way more than two years, Johan. Yeah, it's, it's been, been <laughs> closer to five, maybe. Yeah, that's okay. So, um, yeah. So we moved into this in about 2010, 2000 through 2012. I started in annual vegetable farming back in 2004. Did that for a number of years. And then when we moved on to the property we're currently on, the site limitations, soil limitations, basically blew out of the water everything I've been taught from <laughs> annual vegetable farming. Right. And we couldn't <clears throat> access our fields. It was boggy, wet, compacted clay subsoil. But it wasn't wet down in the bottomlands either because Correct. I know your site, you're, you're way up on, on the top right, of the hill. Right, exactly. It's basically a cliffside on the edge of the Delaware River. Yeah. You'd think it was silt loam from the NRCS web soil survey data. It's not, you know, 300, 400 years of farming. Eh. So maybe it was once upon a time. Maybe yeah. at some point yeah. it was. So that kind of pushed our our limits on hey, how do we approach this thing called agriculture, farming, etc. Um, had some early influence from people like Sepp Holzer, Robert Hart's Forest Gardening, Dave Jackie's work, and we were trying to figure out hey, how do we meld all these things together with the ecological restoration, pair that with agricultural production and you know, see if we can start a viable business from there. And that, that's part of why we ran into each other in the first right. place, because it's the same parallel of like my own, my own personal path is that, uh, you know, I grew up in, in the industrial East in, in Massachusetts. Yeah. And, you know, seriously, it was during the industrial collapse when most of the manufacturing capacity went right. away. The rivers would run red and blue and green and orange. They've been featured in National Geographic before they put in wastewater treatment plants. And I wanted to like figure out how, what can I do to actually have a a real impact to make a real change myself I can join the protests I can sign these you know different you know uh, whatever documents they call it but it was before the internet obviously yeah. of course well but what can I do to make a real impact and uh, what can I do to also grow my own food for my family and friends and mm -hmm. sell some and actually generate revenues and came up with this crackpot idea is, well, what if, what if we imitate the plant community types of, of the local wherever we are and select the species out of that, the perennial species out of that, that are edible, saleable, whatever, so tall trees, medium bushes, shrubs, vines, canes, all that kind of stuff, sell all those products as our farm uh, revenues and use those revenues to continue to do the ecological restoration on the site, site right. and and that's when we ran into each other yep. as I was showing other people that. So yeah. it was in 1995 that that um, my my latest personal project that I've been involved in in um, Southwest Wisconsin New Forest Farm. Mm -hmm. That's when we got that started, and the idea was to mimic the plant community type of the oak savanna. Right. And then uh, use that 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 framework 
to produce the crops that we want. And they started with the, the canopy layer of the Fagaceae, oak, chestnut, mm -hmm. or beech. Malice is an understory layer. At Malice are your apples. Um, hazelnut is the shrub component. Raspberries, blackberries, grapes, currants, gooseberries, forage, and livestock. Right. And the livestock are the managers to manage that system. So I've been doing that since 1995 now. Yeah, fair enough. And so our story has a similar overlap in that we moved onto this property in 2010, ran up against all these issues with the annual vegetable model, <clears throat> and then said, okay, well, we have some friends that are in the ecological restoration, native plant community side of things. There's this whole permaculture realm of things that's talking about food forestry, stacking functions, plant architecture, et cetera. So we started looking around our property, and lo and behold, one of the only productive plants from a human consumption standard uh, was uh, elderberry. So right. we said, oh, boom, we got something here. So so you, so you had a, a, a native plant that actually produced a human food that grew right. all by itself with no care in the ditches and on the margins on the side. And completely degraded soil. Right. You know, so taking that ecological analog model and saying, okay, here we have something that's productive. How do we scale this up? We ended up running into, um, you know, a little, little bit of a touch and go site development. You know, let's try this. Ah, that didn't quite work. Let's try this. Didn't quite work. And, you know, wary of those heroic measures coming in, well, we're going to just make this site do what it wants to do or do what we want it to do. Uh, we kind of tiptoed into that. But then in early 2012, there was a drought in our region. Said, okay, I can get in there with our conventional tillage <coughs> equipment, do what we need to do. But then at the same time, why don't we do some earthwork shaping? So we ended up regrading the landscape, putting in a series of ponds throughout the property, and then creating perennial raised beds so that we then started planting the elderberry, currant, culinary medicinal herbs into the understory. But what's interesting about that is, you know, we're thinking successionally too. So the elderberry. And, what you, what, and let's explain to people yeah. what is meant by succession. So the ecological concept that, roughly speaking, loosely speaking, things go from bare soil to forested ecosystems in the <clears> Northeast. <throat> so how do we harness that process? And so we can take bare soil, which is what we do with annuals, keep resetting succession over and over again, and then actually guide that or, or steer it in a certain direction. And so, so even if we are increasing the soil organic matter, and we're staying in the realm of annual plants, we grow our annual crop, increase the organic matter, but then we disturb it again, we right. set it back successionally. So uh, what you're doing is different, and how is that different? And, and what, is, what is the fundamental difference of how you are, are carrying that forward through time? The image that I relate to is fighting against the wind. So are you <laughs> like pushing, like, oh man, I got this, this <clears throat> wind bearing down on me. And so that's that an annual approach. Like I'm constantly out there weeding. If I'm not weeding, I'm using black plastic. If I'm not you know, using black plastic, I need tillage equipment to constantly disturb that soil when my crop, why that one single crop is growing in that field. And so what we switch that to is, hey, can we put up a sail and ride with wind? And so that's succession you know, for us. It's how do we put plants in the ground that we can then harvest over time and through time. So in our case, it started with annuals. So we did a couple of farmers markets that first year, had a season's worth of annual vegetables planted in those beds that we were able to harvest while the elderberry, while the currants were coming online and maturing over time. Right. And that, that right there, that both of us discovered that, uh, in part by necessity yep. because you know we're doing our market garden stuff you know like i said i've been growing organic produce so i'd grow my organic produce in the alley in between rows yep. of the perennials because in the short term right now i put my hazelnuts in the ground they're not going to produce hazelnuts for three four five seven right. years whatever same with apples and chestnuts and pine nuts are even longer than that but i can still cash flow using my annual crop and use any revenues from that to continue to do the ecological sure. restoration and the in the species that i chose like yours, you were choosing the elderberry because it was working in your area. It belongs mm -hmm. there. I was choosing the ecological plant community that was native to the upper Midwest, which was that oak savanna plant community type. And when I all of a sudden planted that, instead yeah. of uh, working to con control the weeds and control the pests and do this and the other thing to fight against reality so my crop would grow, yeah. well, my crop was reality. It was, right. the, it was the ecological reality right. that belongs there. And it 
almost takes care of itself. Yeah, you know, we sure. still have to manage it and guide it, mm -hmm. but it takes care of itself yeah. almost. Yeah, but that's that aspect of successional guidance too, right. right? So if something's cropping up that we don't necessarily want, desire, need in our landscape, we still have management and control practices for that, but we're fighting a lot less against yeah. everything. And so how do we push things forward? And the other thing I like about it is how does this actually fit into the whole you know, kind of uh, regenerative ag scene. Well, I was just going to ask know, you whatnot. next, what does that so, have to do with re regenerative? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, mean, I know you and I have talked about this before, and, and while regenerative might be the buzzword at this point, how do we actually really create regenerative systems? So how are those self-sustaining, low management, ongoing long-term systems that can last generations, centuries, et cetera. And, and a little bit of background information for people listening to this, both Johan and I have some uh, training in, in ecology, and the term regeneration has at least a 400-year track record of being described and studied by scientists. It began in, in Germany with uh, forestry and natural resources and, and most recently ecology. And, and regeneration is the ability of a everything from a cell to an individual to a community to a, a population, to a ecosystem, to survive the conditions of a site, mm -hmm. whatever it throws at it with the soils the way they are, and to uh, continue to persist through time, despite whatever nature throws at it, and then to propagate and regenerate its own populations and spread and expand. Right. So from my perspective, and at least I know from your your educational perspective is that regeneration means the ability of this system to propagate and expand itself really without us. Mm -hmm. It's the elderberries in the right. ditch on the side of your farm. Right. They don't need us to <clears throat> propagate, to grow and expand. And guess what? They still provide food for us. Yeah. That's exactly. pretty cool. Yep. Yep. For sure. So hmm. where do we go from here then? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, one, you know, one of the things that, that is fascinating, if you look at that successional pathway, you already talked about it, yeah. um, we're going to have annual plants. Annual yeah. plants are part of nature. If a tree falls down and there's right. bare soil exposed, annual plants grow like crazy. So that's part of the system. But uh, from my perspective, the ecological perspective, the annual plants aren't the answer. They aren't the be-all, end-all. They're a phase mm -hmm. that then should follow by perennials, grasses, then shrubs, sun-loving plants, and eventually shade-tolerant plants. Right. Well, in the upper Midwest, to get to the shade-tolerant closed canopy forest of, of uh, basswood maple, mm -hmm. that might take... 1200 years for well, sure. okay well then what happens after 1200 years a tornado comes by and knocks it all down yep. or a fire comes by and burns it all up right. that's a disturbance right well, we can mimic that disturbance by clear cutting it and then planting corn <laughs> and start the whole system <laughs> over again on one farm you and i can't do that i'm not going to last right. 1800 years right but as a region we can we can successionally plan out these, this, these many acres of annuals, these many acres yep. of short-term perennials, longer-term perennials, sun-loving perennials, shade-tolerant perennials, mushrooms to decay the whole thing, yep. and the cycle just keeps going around and around. Yeah, fair enough. And like one of my uh, you know, nerdy ecological buzzword terms is that steady state shifting mosaic. So what you're describing is that- Say that again, the steady, steady state, state shifting, shifting mosaic. mosaic. Bam. So we have something in a relatively steady state. It's not necessarily at an equilibrium, but it's at a steady state. And then you have the shifting mosaic idea, like you're saying, like how do we play with disturbance and succession in a way that changes through the landscape over broad scale patterns, whether that's within our farm, within our community or bioregionally, and how do we harness that potential for meeting all our needs, as you're saying? So, And the elderberries in New Jersey right. and the hazelnuts in the upper Midwest, they've been able to survive and, and persist everything for the past umpteen ice ages, floods, heat, drought, right. fire, windstorm, you know, horrible grazing, et cetera. They actually persist. They regenerate. They yep. grow. They expand. That's right. pretty cool. Right. Yeah. So it's this notion of how do we... How do we put plants in the ground that we're not necessarily having to replant every year, but then also if anybody steps away from it, that ecology keeps functioning. We still have the habitat we're looking for. The, the wildlife populations are, are, are able to come back to these areas, you know, butterflies, repopulate areas, exactly. Wild pollinators, right. yeah, and no matter what happens, if it's a flood or a hurricane yep. down in the southeast or, or a fire in California, it rebounds. Right, it and rebounds. so this notion of resiliency, how do we yeah. create systems that are actually can bounce back from these stresses? So we, so we plant the it. things that belong there and are adjusted and adapted to the crap that the planet can throw <laughs> at it yep. and figure out how to manage that. 
Heck yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. And so since the tape is still raw, I'm not going to talk about no. labeling, not going to talk about standards, what designates this and what they... The one thing I do want to say, though, soil or organic matter, carbon in the soil, it's not the be-all, end-all. Whoa, right. that's like some heresy. Well, if you're in a soil that has had depleted organic matter over time, well, yeah, for crying out loud, let's increase the organic matter, take the carbon out of the atmosphere. But if you're in a soil that's a peat-derived soil uh, or a muck soil, which is usually formerly drained lakes and swamps, your organic matter is already high and through the roof. Mm -hmm. You will actually get higher productivity, you will produce more food, and the plants that you are growing will actually grow more vigorously and take more carbon out of the atmosphere into their bodies if you add minerals to it, which mm. decrease the organic matter because the problem there is too much carbon in the soil. There's a, there's a principle in forestry called site saturation. Hmm. You will get to a certain point in time where that, 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 that site is saturated with carbon. It cannot okay. take in anymore, cannot store anymore, can't put it anywhere else. The, the biggest um, uh, total you know, carbon site saturation, total pounds, tons of carbon per acre in the Northeast anyways, in the upper Midwest, is the white pine, mature old growth white pine right. forest community type. Yeah. Well, it can't sequester anymore. And this is where it gets weird because I know a lot of the foresters and loggers say that, oh, if you want to take more carbon out of the atmosphere, we need to cut down these old redwoods because they're decadent. Mm. They're not growing as fast as a young right. redwood forest would go. So right. let's put these younger, vigorous ones on. There's too much carbon in the soil. There's not enough biological life. Let's get more minerals on it. And actually, you know, in one sense, they're right. But what we're doing is we're getting rid of a most amazing specialist ecosystem. So I think to, to, get, to get focused on increasing the site carbon is mm. short-sighted. And it mm -hmm. plays into the hands of the people that can then tell you that productivity is greater when you decrease the carbon, which in those circumstances, peat soils, muck soils, is actually accurate. Hmm. And then that also plays into the hand of people who say, we have to cut down all the old growth forests right. and get these young, fast right. growing trees. Yep. Yes, a large redwood tree is actively cycling more carbon than like 55 or 100 or 1,000 mm -hmm. young trees. Mm -hmm. But over the whole size of the site, the younger trees are growing faster and are on this uptake, this increased size, mm. whereas the old growth and mature ones have kind of leveled off and tapered right, off. Right, right, right. And what you're saying with the minerals, I wonder how much m the difference between the mineral accumulation is between those populations. And is there another function, ecologically speaking, that gives us reason to value? So that's why I sites. think that, that, a, that a narrow sighted focus on purely, you know, increase in carbon in your soil, that's a narrow, short sighted focus. Mm -hmm. And we have to get have a bigger, larger conversation and not freak out and not get like YouTube freaked and, and Facebook like mongers and say that this is the one true and the <laughs> only way because we live on a very complex planet. There's a lot right. of stuff going on and we really don't understand all of it. Yep. And we need to have a, a sane, rational conversation about how do we as human beings interact in a in a neutral to beneficial way right. to the plant communities and animal communities on our planet. Yeah, and that's what it comes down to me is that 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 ecosystem or ecological focus. If we're restoring our watersheds, if we're planting our native plant communi communities or the mimics <clears throat> of them, if we're bringing that wildlife and that habitat back in, we have a multifaceted metric right there already, right. you know, so. And guess what? A system like that, based on the perennials of the natural plant community types, will regenerate. <laughs> it will plant itself despite the fire, despite the hurricanes, despite the tornadoes, despite the trampling herds of bison, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yep. And that's regenerative. And round and round it goes. Thank you, Mark Shepard and Johan Rinkins, for having that conversation today, getting us to think successionally and giving us that deep ecological perspective that allows us to think with that thousand year perspective. If you like conversations like this, follow us for more regeneration conversations, visit organiccompound.org and follow the work of these two amazing leaders in the regenerative space. Thanks so much.